behind my yard, in the backyard, is a beautiful green tree. Not terribly tall, a little bit higher than the ceiling. And it's round. Yeah. And it's, what color? Green. What color is it? Green. That's right. I remember now. But it's got some spots on it. And they're round spots in the tree. All over in the tree are these round spots. And they're not green. They're orange. What kind of a tree is it? You think it's a pine tree? It's a round tree. Is it a pine tree? No. And if it has orange spots, is it a pine tree? It's an orange tree. But you know, one day, I picked up a very nice orange. It wasn't off that tree, but I picked up this nice orange, and it looked really nice. It was just soft enough to be juicy and sweet. And I had eaten another one out of the same bag, and it was very juicy and sweet. And so I was really excited about this orange. And so I started peeling, and I peeled it off. And, and I used to peel the whole peeling off in one big long circle because my daughter thought that was really cute. And she always wanted to have that big long strung out peeling. And so I peeled the whole orange and my teeth were all set for a nice orange. My mouth was watering and I had it all peeled off and that white stuff all off. And I split it in half and it was black. Down inside of it, it was black. Have you ever seen an orange that was black on the inside? Have you ever seen one? Well, let me tell you. If you see one, don't eat it. Because you know what that black is? It's rotten. It is rotten. Do you know what I did with the orange? What would you do with a rotten orange? Throw it away. Now, why would I tell you this story? Because human beings, you, me, mommies and daddies, church people, neighbors, all kinds of people, people can look very nice on the outside. They can say the right words. They can have the right actions. But inside, they're rotten. They're not loving. They're not kind. Do you want to be rotten on the inside? No. no. We want Jesus to live on the inside so that what comes out is we're like a nice orange, sweet and juicy and nutritious. Because when people see that inside, no matter what we look like on the outside, once they see what's on the inside and we're rotten, they tend to back away as they should. So boys, I just pray that you will ask Jesus every day to help you to be sweet on the inside. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, thank you for making the oranges and making them so sweet and tasty and nutritious. But sometimes they rot. And when they do, we can't use them. Help us not to be like that orange, but to be like the others that are sweet and juicy and that people then will enjoy us and we can be kind and loving to them and they will appreciate it. Bless us as we worship you here today. Amen. That song says a lot, doesn't it? It really says a lot. Now, what we want to study this morning is about the essence of really who we are. You know, sometimes we can have a sour stomach. And in other cases, we can just downright have a bad heart. You know, what's on the inside is what we really are. What you see on the outside may be a reflection of what's on the inside. It to some degree always is. But sometimes we can hide. We can camouflage. Or we only allow people to see a certain part of us. 
or because we're only around somebody in a certain setting, we only see one aspect of them. You know, like the orange. When the orange was bought in the store, who knew it was black inside? When it was picked from the tree, who would know? It isn't until you go into the inside of the orange would you be able to know that it was black in there. Interesting. Let's pray. God, help us today to not see anyone in this room. Help us not to see anyone we know except ourselves and you. So Lord, today as we study, as your Holy Spirit talks to us, don't bring up anybody's name but our own and yours. Help us, Lord, to have some personal introspection. We've all stood before the mirror this morning and we've looked at ourselves there. But now, Lord, help us to look inside. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew, chapter 15. You know, God has made a covenant with us. And that covenant is a covenant for all eternity, isn't it? Salvation is not about something that happens in this life alone. Salvation is for eternity. And you think about it, if salvation is for all eternity, and we determine in this life where we're going to spend eternity, how valuable is this life? Well, let me say it another way. If all of the next world and all eternity hinges upon this life, how valuable is this life? Well, it's worth at least as much as the next life. In other words, if you think eternity in a perfect world with no sin, no sorrow, no pain, no heartaches, if you think that's valuable, you should put that much value into today to make sure that you have that tomorrow. Does that make sense? So the man that was tilling the rented field and ran his plow or whatever into a treasure that had been buried. As he looked at the treasure and began to realize its value, he said, you know, the value of this far exceeds every single thing I own. Yeah, I hear some of you saying, even his wife? Well, let me make that real clear, real simple. He never owned her. Let's get that straight, man. So all the things that he owned, the land, the house, the marble floors, the beautiful car, all, excuse me, all of the things that he owned do not add up to the treasure buried in the dirt. By the way, those that aren't willing to dig in the dirt to find treasures never find the treasure. There are some people not humble enough to live normal life, to take on the duties of life and find the treasures that God has given. They're too proud. And they don't find the treasure. They don't see it. It doesn't exist as far as they know. And so you remember the story. The man went home, sold everything he had. That was a big yard sale. Sold the house, sold everything. And everybody thought he was crazy. Do you have people who think you're crazy for going to church on the Sabbath? If you don't have some that think that about you, there's somebody else here that does. And, and even in the church, it's easy for some people to say, you're a vegan? Now, are vegans more likely to go to heaven than non-vegans? 
Well, now, you know, we could ask those kinds of questions and just stir up controversy and, and, and we could start judging each other. But that's not what it's about. As is not what it's about. But unless you make a mistake, if you're not careful about your diet, you're not being very careful about getting the treasure. Because diet does affect what you are. So this man went home and got rid of everything so that he could have a treasure that was worth far more than what he had before. Now here in Matthew chapter 15, it says, then the scribes, verse 1, Matthew 15, verse 1, then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is symbolic of what? Hagerstown, Maryland. What's in Hagerstown, Maryland? General Comforts. No, no, not Hagerstown. It's Review and Herald does. But in a sense, this would be like the GC. Or if you're in a local conference, Orlando. In other words, here was Jesus in the heart of the city that had the primary temple of God. And these Pharisees, the highest leaders of the church, it says that they came to Jesus and they said, why do your disciples, not him of course, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now Jesus... Look at your followers. You know, they're not following proper traditions. Are traditions important? They could be. Can traditions be bad? Sure, there's traditions that are bad. There's good and they're bad. What is a tradition? I mean, in the first place, what is it? Yeah, very simply, it's just what we've been doing. It has no implication of good or bad. Tradition is just, we've done this for a while. That's all it means. We've been doing it. It's a tradition. It has no positive connotation. It has no negative connotation. It's something we've been doing. So for the Pharisees to say, your disciples aren't following a tradition is not a negative implication necessarily. But to them it was. Because you see, in their minds, their spiritual traditions was the law of God. Now, is it appropriate for us to make that jump? That just because the Pharisees taught it, just because it had been being done for a while, does that make it truth? Does it? Not at all. Not at all. There's a lot of sinful tradition. And so just because it's a tradition, or just because it's in the church, or just because I did it a long time, has nothing to do to state whether it's right or wrong. But the Pharisees were making that leap. Notice Jesus' response to them. But he answered and said to them in verse 3, Why do you... Oh, Jesus was sure good at turning things around, wasn't he? They came to him and said, Why do your disciples? He says, Why do you? Now there's an interesting thing here. They didn't come and say, Jesus, why do you? They were very clever. Why do your disciples? Crafty. Not being accusative. Very sly. Why do your disciples? In other words, why do you permit? But he turned it around and looked at him right straight in the eye. And he said, but why do you? Then what does he say? Why do you also transgress the, transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? Boy, he really put it home quick, didn't he? They wanted to raise the issue. They wanted to start a debate. They wanted to be counter. So he simply looked him in the eye and said, but you have a problem. Tell me, why do you violate 
the traditions of God? Is that what he said? What did he say? Commandments. Commandments. Well, from what we've already said, we realize there's a major difference between a command and a simple tradition. The tradition could be right or it could be wrong. They did not take any scriptural grounds as a basis of why the disciples ought to wash their hands, did they? The authority they cited was what? Tradition. What authority did Jesus cite? Commandments of who? Ah, boy, did he put it back. Verse 4. For God commanded, two very important words put together there, saying, honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, now what part of grammar is the three-letter word but? It's a conjunction. It's a conjunction. What is a conjunction? Connects two parts. Sometimes it connects two parts that are similar. But this conjunction connects two parts that are opposite. But. And would be two parts that are the same, right? But is two parts that are opposite, different. So God said, honor your father and your mother and so on, but you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me has been dedicated to the temple, is released from honoring his father and his mother. Thus, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your what? Traditions. And then he gave them a name. He described them. A descriptive word. What is this word? Hypocrite. hypocrite. How many of you are hypocrites? Am I the only one? Gordon says he is. Shirley says she is. We're just being honest, folks. I'm a hypocrite. I'm a hypocrite. What's a hypocrite? Someone that pretends at times to be one thing when they're not. Have you done that yet today? Have you pretended something that is different than the way your heart is sometimes? I'm not going to tell you how I'm a hypocrite. Never. But I am willing to say that in my sinful nature, I'm still a hypocrite. God's working on me, and I'm working with him. That's how we quit being hypocrites, right? Allowing God to transform us so that we don't just appear to be Christian, but that we are through and through, thoroughly, 100% at all times. Verse 7, hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying. He said, Isaiah said it way back then of what you'd be like, and boy did he get it right. And then he quotes Isaiah. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now, how can you be close with your lips and so far away with your heart when your heart and your lips aren't that far apart? Verse 9, And in vain they worship me. Would you think me out of place if I said you're wasting your time here this morning? If you have no intention of surrendering to God what he says to you this morning. If you came to this church this morning with any motive less than to allow God to touch you and change you into something that your human nature does not want to be. 
and to give up things that your human nature wants to hang on to. If you did not come willing to let God change you, you might as well walk out right now. I see you're all still here. Thank you. I'm glad you are. Because the only thing that makes us Christ-like is to be humble and to be willing to let him remake us into his image. In our natural human state, we're not pretty on the inside. I know people that just the sight of blood makes them faint. My wife was taking those classes before the birth of our, I think it was our first child. And we were sitting in there on the floor, you know, with a bunch of couples. And there's one dude sitting over just not too far from us, just real close. You know what I mean by dude, you know, he's tough, he's big body, strong, you know, and looked the part, you know, of a macho guy. And the leader's up there and she's talking about breathing and all this stuff, you know, and she's telling stuff and I don't know if he got a nosebleed or what, but he got up and walked out the door and he hadn't much more gone out the door and there was this thud. I didn't think anything of it because you don't know what's happening out there. But somebody else noticed. Several people jumped out. The guy got outside the door and passed out and landed on the floor. He might have been macho, but he wasn't tough. He couldn't even hear what the instructor was talking about, much less see it or have it happen to himself. He wasn't very, very tough, was he? Sometimes spiritually, we have the same problem. We may look good, but we're not so good. He says, in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine, teaching as doctrine, the commandments of men. Now, if we were to paraphrase that in another way that would be quite similar, teaching for truth, the things that we've done for years that may not be doctrine, they may not be based on principle, but they're based on what we've done for years. You remember some months back, we talked about the difference between principle and application. It's very easy for us to take our our, our traditions and our applications and teach them as though that was the principle. Let me give you an example. How many of you were taught that you should not go into a theater because it was the place of the devil? How many of you were taught that? Okay. Yeah. Say that to a young person today and see what kind of response you get. That the reason you shouldn't go to the theater because it's a place of the devil. Do you think that is true? I do. I think Satan uses it very effectively. But I have a better reason for not going. Because what is there is nothing that my ears should hear or my eyes should see and the people I should not associate with while they're involved in that kind of activity. But you see, the problem is when you say that to a young person, they're like, what? Because I can bring the same DVD home and watch it in my home. Or I can just get on the internet and watch it. I don't even have to borrow the DVD. And so we tell them to stay out of the theater. And so they go home and watch something worse. We're teaching for doctrine the application that fit some years ago. The Pharisees were doing that. So the focus was on their practices of the past, the things that they had come up with, their applications to the principle, and they taught it as truth. Then Jesus called his disciples, the multitude, and said to them, verse 10, hear and what? Understand. Two parts here. Pay attention. Listen to it. Don't go to sleep in the sermon. You can't hear when you're sleeping, right? At least I don't do too well at that. So he says, first, hear it. We have to expose ourselves to it. We have to take the time to read it, if it's reading. 
But also, we must take the energy and pray for the Holy Spirit to actually understand as well. It's not good enough to just read the words of the Bible. We need to understand its meaning. So he says, hear and understand. Then he gives something very important. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Sorry about that. Now that's a very important principle. It's not what goes into the physical mouth, even if it were a rotten orange, that defiles you. But the things you say. In verse 12, Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? May I, may I put that into today's setting? <clears throat> that would be like somebody calling me up during the week and saying, Pastor Thomas, are you aware that one of the elders was offended by what you said in your sermon? Is it possible that I've offended some of you? Sure it is. Sure it's possible. Has God ever offended you? He's offended me many times. I just didn't want to hear what he had to say. It went against my nature. It's very offensive. It hurts. But it's truth. Can, can we change what we are? Should we change the message to the world or to each other because it might offend somebody? Now, you remember our Sabbath school lesson this way. God was going to send messengers. Sound an alarm. Was God concerned about offending somebody? No. If he didn't offend anybody, he wouldn't save anybody. <clears throat> so he goes on. But he answered and said in verse 13, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Now, this is in direct answer, response to the disciples saying, Jesus, are you aware that some of the religious leaders were offended? You hurt their feelings. He says, do you understand, disciples, that if God didn't put them there, they're going to be uprooted? In other words, not every plant that is planted, not every leader that's a leader, not every member in the church did God put there. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will what? Fall into the ditch. If you're blind and are depending on someone to lead you, it doesn't matter what your intentions are. If you're following a blind person, you're going to go where they go. So pick who leads you carefully. Verse 32. I'm sorry, not verse 32, verse 15. Then Peter answered and said to him, explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, are you also still without understanding? He says, have you not got that figured out yet? So then he goes on. Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach, processed, and eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth, which come uh, out of the mouth, they're coming straight from where? The heart. And they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, theft, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. 
So in other words, if I've been handling the wrong things and my hands have bacteria and all kinds of filth on them and I eat an orange and some of that dirt and filth and bacteria gets into my mouth and into my digestive tract, I'm not defiled. I may get sick physically, but I'm still the same spiritual being. So while the Pharisees are looking at their traditions, you know, you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you have to do it this way, and you have to do it at this time, and you have to do it for this, this, and this, and this. Those aren't the things that defile us, folks. You may have a completely different way of showing your love for God than I do. I remember I was teaching a seminar up at Camp Kalakwa, and we were talking about reverence and respect, and, and it was interesting. I talked about how I was taught to never place anything on my Bible. The Bible always went on top. How many of you were taught that? Okay. How many of you were taught something different from that? One. We came to a break in the class, and, and a young fellow came up, and he says, Pastor Thomas, he said, I was taught exactly the opposite. He said, where I grew up, we never put the Bible on top. We never put anything, put the Bible on top of anything. It always went on the bottom. I'd never heard that before. And my response was, why? What did that mean? Well, he said, the Bible is God's word. It's the foundation of all truth. God is the foundation of everything. Anything not built on God is wrong. It's false. So he said, everything goes on top of the Bible. But you know what? I'm going to guess that in our culture... Had someone this morning walked up to the front and placed something on top of one of these two Bibles, one of us at least might have had some very negative thoughts about that person without knowing that they were showing respect to God and His Word in the way they were taught. It's just a tradition. You see, it's what's in the heart that counts, isn't it? So if you put your Bible on top because that's your way of showing God that you honor His Word, that's your heart speaking. That's your heart acting. If you were raised the other way and you come up and put the Bible under everything else, you put your hymnal on top and you put your quarterly on top because you believe that God's Word should be the foundation of everything and you're showing your respect that way, it's just your tradition. But your heart is still pure. So we have to be a little careful here about judging each other's tradition. The way you do something may be very different than I do, and I shouldn't judge you by my standard. But simply to make sure that our hearts are right. That's what's important. Now, if you notice what God is really saying here, this is heavy stuff. In fact, what he says in those verses from 16 to 20 is part of the heart of the gospel. You take all those things you've learned about God and His love and His forgiveness and His power to save, His power to change you, here it is. That the focus, the heart of what we are is our choices. Now, part of what we see in these verses here is we see a controversy between the religious leaders, the Pharisees in this case, and the disciples of Jesus. Picking, picking, picking. Well, when the Pharisees were picking on the disciples, there's another word that we often use. What were they really doing to the disciples? It starts with a J. They were judging them, weren't they? That's the implication. Why do your disciples do this? You know it's wrong. That's the implication, isn't it? 
Judgmentalism. Let me ask you a question. Where did judgmentalism come from? What part of the Pharisee did it come from? It came from his heart. Judgmentalism is a heart cancer, isn't it? Yeah. And so the very thing they were picking at was their own problem. Do you see anything in Jesus' answer that was judgmental? No. No. He simply said, look, folks, let's get it straight. The Pharisees are being judgmental. They've got their way of picking on you. But if you take a look, they've got the problem. The part that they accuse you of, that is eating without washed hands, isn't a problem. Because what defiles you is what defiles the heart. It's those things that we say out of the heart, the things that we do out of the heart. That defiles the human. That degrades us from being the children of God. We're kind of looking in the mirror this morning, aren't we? Yeah, we're, we're looking at a mirror that is more than the standard mirror. You see, I remember as a kid, and some of you probably did that, we went to a shoe store, which wasn't very often because we didn't have that many shoes. But I remember going to the shoe store, and, and the shoe salesman says, we got this neat thing over here. You know, have him put the shoe on, and then we'll come over and stick his foot in there, and we'll see where his foot is in the shoe. How many of you have done that? Yeah. Well, they quit doing it because they realized that x-ray wasn't good for us, that that was too much. But it was really cool. You stick your foot in there, and here's the shoe, and you can see right where your foot is. You can see if your toe is crunched up or if it's too wide. You know, a kid won't always tell you how the foot feels in the shoe. So all you have to do is just look at it. Well, this morning, we're looking in the God's x-ray. And God's x-ray machine says, look at your heart. Look what's on the inside. Look at your motives. Look at your humility or lack of. He says, that, that is what the essence of life is. For out of the abundance of the heart, the man speaketh. 